if you come and give a keynote on the second or even worse, the third day, everybody's really whacked out, you know, they've had enough of lectures, they've usually got their mobiles out and become completely contemptuous of the speakers. So it's great to be here on the, on the, on the first day. Because I'm in a rather awkward situation here because I'm going to really attack the lecture as a concept, as a sort of hopeless pedagogic technique, but I'm here giving one. And uh, of course, I'm uh, well aware of the contradiction, but that's the way of the world, unfortunately. I'm going to give my talk a sort of narrative act. I have a sort of grudge to be, bear here. I'm 54 years old, and 30 years ago, when I went to university for the first time, I went to do a science degree and did physics, maths, and chemistry in my first year. And I was quite a bookish kid, you know? Uh, I was mustard keen to go to university. It came from a sort of dark, small, Calvinist Scottish town. It was my ticket to freedom until I attended my first physics lecture, where a guy mumbled in without looking at the audience and stood for 50 minutes on three chalkboards from left to right, drawing up maths, mumbling, barely comprehensible, absolutely hopeless. It was sort of devastating in a way because I didn't think that was what I was in for. And I've been in physics lectures recently, and believe me, they haven't changed one jot. You know that, I know that, the students know that. So much so, I say I've come here with a grudge, that I actually changed. At the end of my first year, I said, I've had enough of this. And I changed to do philosophy. I ended up with a degree, PhD in philosophy, so on and so forth. Anyway, forget that story. But I want to concentrate on physics today because it's an absolutely fascinating subject. I believe in the scientific method. Strangely enough, hardly anybody who teaches physics seems to believe in the application of the scientific method to teaching. Hardly anybody who teaches in a university believes in the application of the scientific method to teaching and learning. Precious few know anything about it. Fewer still make the effort to read or look at the research. And this is a problem, a big, big problem for students and institutions as we know them. Now, I'll tell you a story, I'll start with a little physics story. When the, uh, a, a mustard keen student like me at 1718 went to the University of Copenhagen and uh, he had to sit his entrance exam and one of the questions in the physics paper was you're standing on top of a tall building with a barometer, how do you determine the height of the building? And this smart ass student actually gave the answer, I'm gonna drop the barometer from the top of the building and time it and from that I know the constant gravity, I'll work out the height of the building. Failed the exam. He was a smart kid, this, and he did want him into the faculty, so they interviewed him and gave him an oral exam. He said, listen, focus on the physics. Give us the correct answer of the exam. So he said, well, I'm going to take the barometer, and I'm going to use it like a ruler, and I'm going to measure up the building. <laughs> and then his third answer was to use trigonometry and use the shadow of the building and take the, uh, the mercury from the barometer and use it as a, sort of, you know, a, a surveying device. Anyway, they had given enough and accepted him in. That guy turned out to be Niels Bohr. And the the great thing about that story is physics is an absolutely wonderful subject. It's actually quite easy to get quite far in physics at an undergraduate level without knowing much about physics. You really can just gen up on examples and textbooks and know the formula and apply the maths and get past. The truth of the matter is that most physics students are really still stuck in a sort of Aristotelian uh, form of physics. You know, they still have that everyday view of physics and don't really get to the heart of the matter. It's an incredibly difficult subject to learn, an incredible incredibly difficult subject to teach. So I'll focus on physics a little bit as I go through. Anybody here heard of uh, Maslow? It's, it's a damn shame that that stupid theory is still floating around and train the trainer courses, whatever courses you've, uh, you know, the only, uh, there was no academic basis to, to Maslow's work whatsoever, complete armchair theory. And it's a completely impoverished view of human nature, this little stupid pyramid. It only survives because it's easy to put on a PowerPoint as a little <laughs> curved triangle. It's absolutely hopeless, but it's not unusual in the training and educational world to go on these really stupid courses. I was a school governor in a local secondary school, and the inset days were full of the Mozart effect and NLP and left-right brain theory and learning styles. Absolute bogus nonsense. If you go into the training world, it's even worse with Kirkpatrick, Gagne, all the 50-year-old theories. Nobody's bothered to update them. Nobody questions them, and it's hanging around. They're hanging around like fossils. Back to Maslow, however, he did say one 
very nice thing which I like, which is if you go around often enough with a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. And this is what happens in academia. When new teachers come in, I hate the word lecturers. A lecturer, is that what you do? You lecture people? We should abolish that job description. The first thing they do, though, is simply look at what they're going to teach. Hardly any reflection on how they're going to teach, because they're simply going to teach the way they were taught, which is through the lecture. The lecture is the default. Absolute default in teaching in universities. Nobody questions it. Now, they're meant to be researchers. You're meant to be questioning critical thought as a whole point, but nobody is questioning this fundamental truth. Now, I know I've, many of you will think, oh, Donald, you haven't been in a university recently. It's all different. There's lots of discussions in there. It's all very jazzy and so on. Bollocks. <laughs> it is not. I'm in and out of universities all the time. I sit in lectures. I come to conferences. I see what's happening, and that's not much change. Now, I'm not absolutely against lectures per se, if they're good. In fact, I'll say uh, this is my favorite example of a lecture. If you're going to give lectures, don't do it to five people or 500 or 5,000. Go for 10,000. If you're going to stand and broadcast, get some scale in here. And the crazy English guy out in mainland China hires football stadiums, 10,000 people a pop, a big PA system, $25 uh, dollars per, st per student. They pay, and that's a lot of money in China. And he teaches them English. They sing songs, they chant, it's motivational, it's a laugh, it's good fun, and they learn English. And I was, if you're going to do these damn lectures, make sure they're bloody good. And why not have them on scale? rather than these rather odd places. You know, you're all sitting with laptops. Does this have PowerPoint? Do, can you actually plug your laptop in this place? I don't think you will. Hopeless arrangement. A Greek amphitheater, basically. Another thing that's interesting about lectures on the positive side, just before I launch into my critique, is that there is good evidence that actually people have higher degrees of retention when they listen to an expert. And it was if you have respect for the person in terms of their academic pedigree, haven't written a book or whatever, then it does actually have a real effect on your psychological attention and therefore retention. So it's not all bad that you should have very good people speaking perhaps in universities, and many students will have gone to a good university because of the academics who are teaching on that course, but that's a tiny portion of students. Hardly any students actually check out the credentials of the academics in choosing a course. Hardly any. I suppose you could safely assume that if you go to Harvard or Oxford, you're going to get that anyway. And I recommend this book highly, The Media Equation, because that's got a very good study within it that shows that effect. Brilliant book anyway, if you're interested in e-learning. Now, let me start with a little bit of video here. If you've seen this before, I apologize, but I still, you know, I've watched it dozens of times, and I'll love it. Do we have the volume, please? Of the, anyone, anyone? The Great Depression, passed the, anyone, anyone, the tariff bill, the Hawley Smoot Tariff Act, which anyone raised or lowered, raised tariffs in an effort to collect more revenue for the federal government. Did it work? Anyone? Anyone know the effects? It did not work, and the United States sank deeper into the Great Depression. Today, we have a similar debate over this. Anyone know what this is, class? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone seen this before? The Laffer Curve. Anyone know what this says? It says that at this point on the revenue curve, you will get exactly the same amount of revenue as at this point. This is very controversial. Does anyone know what Vice President Bush called this in 1980? Anyone? something D-O-O -O economics, voodoo economics. Okay, now every, everybody's laughing there, wry, wry smiles at the, at the very least, because every single one of you have been there. You could not have gone through the schooling process or a degree or college without having been there dozens of times. And if you don't, it's a bit of a caricature, but if you don't imagine that this is happening to hundreds of thousands of kids here today, then you're kidding yourself. This sort of pretense, you know that anyone, anyone? Does anybody know the name of that movie, by the way? Any? Ferris Bueller. And it's still an absolute classic, you know? And kids love it. It was absolutely hit the teenage market. That freedom you feel. I remember, I said I was quite a bookish kid. I can remember now the one day I skipped school. I can remember the rush, the thrill, the freedom of that. 
That's what the movie's about. It's a caricature, but there is a sort of pretense that some lectures are interactive, and indeed, uh, Guy Claxton uh, uh, has looked at this, the people, anybody from University of Bristol here? Yeah, I really, I really love the, uh, the, the research that's going on there, because you know, real hard-headed empirical stuff coming out about what teachers actually do in classrooms. And there is an illusion that teachers ask kid questions and get critical thinking going. But actually, if you go and measure it critically, teachers ask pseudo-rhetorical questions, don't give the, time, the kids time to answer back, cut in immediately. And if you look at the number of questions kids actually ask of a teacher over a year, it's a pitifully low amount, about two a year per pupil. It was a sort of pretense that critical thinking is being taught or that we're encouraging learners to move forward. Okay, I'll ask you a question. Anybody know who these three fellas are from left to right? I'll give you a clue. That's the chronological order. <laughs> uh, what was the order, say? Uh, almost right. It's Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Fair enough. Quite. <laughs> they do look strangely similar up here. And I want to go back, really, to get this arc in for a minute with regard to the Socratic method. You hear people in education talking about the Socratic method. Actually, you know, Socrates was, never wrote a word. It was all represented by, uh, in the dialogues of Plato. However, there was another guy called Xenophon who looked at the Socratic uh, method, and it's not all it's cracked up to be. Socrates was actually a bully. He absolutely harangued the young students into coming around to his view of the world. And it's not the method it's cracked up to be. However, at least it was an attempt at being learner-centric. But if we move on to the next guy, Plato, we have Plato's Academy, which was around until the fifth century AD, hundreds and hundreds of years, the sort of prototype of the university. Again, no lectures. In the Academy, Plato, who took his lead as a pupil of Socrates, had that problem-solving, inquiring, student-centered view of teaching and learning. And then if we skip over to Aristotle, who was, pupil, who was uh, a pupil of Plato's for 20 years, who taught Alexander the Great and so on, and his institution, although it was around before he came along, called the Lyceum, again, in Aristotle, we have the first physicist, the first natural scientist, the guy who took experience and inquiry into the natural, natural world quite seriously. But again, the lecture was not the format in terms of teaching. So where did this whole notion of a lecture or lecturing come from? Well, in the Middle Ages, the word lecture doesn't actually appear until about the 14th century, and it literally means to read. And I was reading a sacred text because, of course, to a degree, Plato and Aristotle were at fault here. Plato through Neoplatonism and uh, St. Augustine and uh, Aristotle through, through Aquinas. We had people who were basically preaching and not teaching, in other words, it wasn't much use giving your students critical abilities because that wasn't the point. You had a sacred text and that was it. And I still to this day absolutely abhor the faith school system. Having worked and traveled in the Middle East and seen the destructive effects of madrasas, having seen church schools indoctrinate their kids, similarly in Judaism, I think it's an appalling thing to do to a young person's mind to close them down in those formative years. And yet that seems, for some reason, I think it's to do with Blair, to have resurfaced in education. You'll all have seen this slide, no doubt. It's like doing the rounds in everybody's slide pack. And this was around uh, 1340, uh, University of Bologna. It's actually not a painting at all. It was a little sort of 10 by 22 centimeter uh, uh, picture in a manuscript before printing, of course. But it's interesting in that the guys, of course, You've seen this at a previous alt talk, which is where I found it in the first place. The guys are sleeping. The guys are not looking at the lecturer at all. The guy, more importantly, is reading from a book, and they have books in front of them, the pre-book era. Now, the word lecture about this time just meant reading. That's all it meant. About the 16th century, it changed its meaning, and it became a word that was associated with instruction. And then if we jump now to the 21st century, actually the word has a rather odd meaning. If somebody says, don't lecture me, it actually is a very strong pejorative word. I don't want to be lectured to, say my kids to me, two 16-year-olds. It's a rather odd term because it still has that didactic, forceful, imposing your view of the world on another person. Okay, let's trip back to the physics for a moment. Who's this? Nope. 
Newton, Isaac Newton, one of the greatest English minds ever. And Newton at Cambridge was obviously a brilliant physicist and absolutely revolutionized physics. But his lectures were interesting. He used to troop along to lectures and nobody would turn up. He actually was seriously autistic, possibly Asperger's. Hopeless lectures, hopelessly muddled, absolutely boring as hell, and nobody would turn up. That's not unusual. The two vice chancellors I know, I live in Brighton, uh, University of Sussex, University of Brighton, so it's a great dark secret, but almost every university has lectures who turn up and no students turn up to them. <laughs> Surprising, isn't it? But true. The difference with Newton is he delivered his lectures anyway. How bizarre is that? He stood there with nobody in the room and delivered them. Talk about a lack of social skills. And then there's a, a very great, a great anecdote I read with Tilda uh, Swindon, the, the actress, who was at Oxford, and she went along to a lecture by uh, Raymond Williams. And Raymond Williams came in. She was the only person there sitting right in the front. And Raymond walked in, didn't even look at her, went up to the lecture, read his lecture, and walked back out at the end again. <laughs> That's now. How bizarre is that behavior? But you know as well as me that there are those weird defaults, those weird behavioral traits in the world. This is Richard Feynman, jumped to the 60s, a very flamboyant physicist, Nobel laureate, fantastic guy, really highly recommend his books, and is credited with having written the finest lectures on physics ever written and delivered. He was a brilliant teacher, highly recommend his biography, as well as the lectures if you're interested in physics. However, this is the biography. He took time out and went to teach students in Brazil and found very quickly that those kids were learning by the book. In other words, they could pass the physics exam, but they knew precious little about real physics. Whenever you really probed, they didn't have any of the tools and instruments to really go on and solve real problems in physics. They could only answer exam questions. This puzzled him, and he went on this huge crusade to rewrite science books, which he thought were awful. He's probably right, even to this day, and published these essays. However, in the preface to the essays, he admits this is the best set of lectures, the best lecturer probably ever in physics, that it was a hopeless task, that teaching physics through lectures was next to useless. The preface is absolutely fascinating. A guy who completely rejected what he had been doing for nearly 20 years. Let's jump on now. This guy is a guy, I thank Seb for this, uh, Seb Schmoller. This is Eric Mazur, who has been teaching at Harvard, physics at Harvard, since 1984, alongside quite a number of Nobel Prize winners. And again, when he joined and he was given the physics course to teach, he didn't realize at the time he was really excited as a new, you know, fresh recruit to Harvard. He didn't realize that all the other people who taught physics absolutely hated undergraduates and wanted nothing to do with this course, which is not an unusual stance in academia this disrespect for undergraduate courses. So he had a crusade. He said, listen, I'm a data-driven guy. He noticed when he went to dinner with some of these guys, these are Nobel Prize winning physicists, that when they discussed education, all they did was revert back not to the scientific method or data or research. What they defaulted back to was anecdote. That's all they had in their back pocket when they described teaching, just some stories. And of course, eventually, and this is the telling point, and I've been here myself with friends of mine who are academic, it always ends on blaming the students. It's always the students who are at fault, the new intake, the internet's ringing our minds, so on and so forth. So he set out to look at the data and ended up writing this book called Peer Instruction, which is absolutely fantastic. And I like this line because it sort of sums up what bad lectures are all about. The lecture is the transfer of the notes of the lecturer to the notebook of the student without passing through either. How true that is. Even today when you go to conferences, and it tends to be more academic speakers, they sometimes literally take out a sheaf of paper and they read it. I'm always absolutely astonished that any adult would subject me as another adult to that experience. Why on earth do I want to sit and listen to somebody read anything? It makes no sense. But again, it's happening in conferences all across the globe today. What he did was he looked at a thing called the FCI test, and it tests physics students on the real understanding of Newton's three laws, okay? Pre-test and post-test. And he got a big shock. Remember, these are students at Harvard, straight-A students. 
he found that they were disastrous. They were Aristotelian physicists. They hadn't even grasped the basic uh, Newtonian laws in his course. And a typical question was, how does the force exerted by a heavy truck compare to the force exerted by a small car when the two hit head on? Okay, bigger, same, smaller, not exerting any force, they're just in each other's way. Nice colloquial English question about physics, really testing whether you know anything about Newton at all. How many would say A? One, a couple. How many would say B? No, small number again. Uh, C, smaller? None. And B? Right, great. The majority refused point blank to answer the question. <laughs> That's great. The correct answer is actually B. Strangely enough, lots of students do answer A, and it's, you know, don't be ashamed if you answer A because that's a sort of Aristotelian view of the world. They sort of associate damage and inertia with, uh, with the, the uh, Newton's law, which is every force has an equal and opposite reaction. So uh, B is actually the right answer there. But he gave them this test and was quite shocked by the results because he found that students well into the course were, weren't doing too well. So he rewrote the rule book and said, I'm not going to lecture in the same way again. I'm going to do something radically different. I'm going to go back to Socrates, and I'm going to lead by probing or creative questions. And he started giving his students questions. To cut a long story short, the students themselves, he certainly saw a noticeable increase in their grades and performance in, the understa in understanding of the physics as well. What he also did was look at this, this issue. When you have a whole load of people in a room and you're teaching physics, do you give them notes to pre-read before the class? Do you hand out the notes at the beginning of the lecture? Uh, do you tell them not to read the notes till the end, which I've heard often enough? Have you even heard, don't take notes, it's all in the handout? Or are the notes handed out at the end? Then he did a little experiment with this and found out that number one was by far, just give the students the stuff, guys. You know? They're not there to listen to you perform. They want to learn physics. And indeed, anybody who says don't take notes is committing an absolute pedagogic criminal act because the studies show that actually 20 up to 30% increases in retention if you take things, if you write notes in your own words, not verbatim notes, which is what students tend to do for the first few weeks uh, before they stop attending lectures altogether. So, interesting guy. He also looked at the seating and found that when you sit the poorer students at the front, and curiously, the smart students at the four corners, this is because he goes into an interactive session on his questioning technique, you get an overall rise in performance. The good students don't suffer, the poor students get brought up to, to the right level. And of course, he, he leads his lectures by, by questions, thought-promoting questions, and he has every student has a clicker. And let me explain how he does this. He poses the question, he then gets all the students to say nothing, just answer. It comes up on histograms on the slide behind them. If the majority get that correct, short discussion, move on to the next topic. The students have grasped it. And these are clever questions. If it isn't, he gets them together in small groups and has peer interaction. And he really does believe that physics, especially Nobel laureates and physics professors at Harvard, Harvard really almost cannot teach physics. They are so good at physics, they cannot bring themselves cognitively down to the level of the learner. And he feels very strongly that students give mutual support in a very positive way and has the empirical data to prove it. So when the majority are incorrect, it goes into discussions and, and far more detail. And it seems to work. Let me jump to another institution. Is anybody here from the Institute of Physics in Theoretical Physics in Trieste? No? Okay, that was a long shot. <laughs> I was there last year, absolutely fascinating. This is an institution who does nothing but teach theoretical physics. And true to form, guys just like this walk in with three chalkboards, boom, 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 that's what they do. Now, the guy Marco there recognized one thing. I, he said, listen, I ain't going to change these guys. They're introverts. They're not going to turn around to the audience. They're not going to be, you know, live wires in terms of talking and lecturing. I have to do it another way. So what they did, and I know that many of you have been involved in this, I mean, I think it's absolutely morally bankrupt that people don't record lectures. I think it's just unbelievable. I mean, I know there are IP issues and so on, but not giving a student the second bite of the cherry? Where did that theory of learning come from? I'm just gonna give you it once, guys, you better listen and that's it. 
Imagine being a journalist or a no I'm a novelist. I read my novel out once. I'm not going to publish it. You better listen. How stupid is that? Especially in learning, because we know that hardly anybody learns anything on one hit. You're going to forget almost everything I tell you today. Before you've hit the car in the car park, it's down to 50%. After a few days, way, way down to 10, 14%. That's a fact. Ebbinghaus, 1885, 120 years of research shows it. Coming back to the Institute, what they did was they simply had a stills camera that took 15 seconds images and the audio of the physics lecture. But what was interesting was the way the students responded. These are students from all over the world who come to this institute speaking different languages. And they had a real problem with these physics guys who were struggling with English. The students were watching on average 13 hours a week of recorded lectures, two hours a night on average. The results from the students on a trend analysis after implementing the system was absolute dogleg. And in other words, it encourages the students to be more inquiring because they can stop you know, and do all the things you know you can do with recorded stuff. But more importantly, they were learning far more than they were before. And if you're interested, I can give you the papers, you know, the empirical studies showing the impact that it had on this institution, which was profound. They, uh, they had a, you know, a cohort of lecturers who started this. It's now culturally become the norm so that uh, you'd be pretty hard pushed to go and try and teach there without adopting this system. You'd be regarded as the outsider. So once you get the ball rolling and you see the results, it starts to work. And then, of course, we have, this has almost become another cliche in terms of slides, uh, Professor uh, uh, Lou in MIT and his physics lectures. I'm actually, not a, <laughs> I'm actually not a great fan. You know, I'm going for a very strong thesis here. I don't like lectures full stop. I don't give a shit if they're recorded. You know, I have piled through YouTube, EDU, and iTunes U. I have watched dozens of these lectures, and they are mostly shit. That's the truth of the matter. The psychology lectures from Bartley, dumped them. It actually had old discredited theory, and it was absolutely appalling some of the stuff that's been shoved up there. What's the point of just recording lectures that were bad in the first place? It makes no sense. We have to have a more sophisticated view of this pedagogic problem, surely, than just saying, let's just shove them down on tape. I think that's good, though, if you're going to have them do that, but it's not the solution to the problem. However, I think Lewin's quote is right here. It's better to see a first-class lecture on video than a mediocre one in the flesh. Why on earth should, I've got twin boys at 16, they're just going into sixth form college, one is a maths physics kid. Why on earth should he be taught by a third-rate physicist in some local institution when I've got people like Professor Lewin and Mazur online? Why on earth would he want to do that? It makes no sense whatsoever apart from this tradition that everybody is a teacher, even though all they want to do is research. And this is the result. Boredom, people cutting out of lectures. So, right, I, I like the story, but so he was a mathematical geneticist in the States, and he used to bring his guinea pigs along and, uh, and, uh, 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 and explain his experiments. And he used to tuck the guinea pig under one arm <laughs> you know, and he'd be chalking away. And at the end of one lecture, he actually took it out and used it as a chalk duster. <laughs> Talk about sort of mad professor, you know? That's what these guys are like. You must remember that in physics especially, the people are largely introvert, highly analytic, bright people with low social skills. Why are you shoving them in front of audiences and trying to get them to lecture and teach and inspire? It doesn't work, and that's true for lots of subjects. And indeed, in this five-year study, on five Russell Group universities, you find that on first year undergraduate students, they come in with pretty full attendance at lectures and then it drops down dramatically to a mean of just over 50% and stays there. In other words, if this were a factory producing, I don't know, you know, table lamps and you were scrapping 50% of them every day, you'd be pretty worried. Nobody really worries about people not attending lectures in the system. Quite odd, really. Is it that bad? Why do students not attend? Because they're bored shitless. We know that. Are we doing anything about it? Not really. Is there something suspect here? The lecture itself? Damn right there is. An interesting book, if you want to start, there are loads of stuff on this. But by and large, the research points in a very clear direction, which is in terms of psychological attention, it's really difficult to hold your attention as a learner in a deep subject like physics for more than 10 minutes. 25 minutes tops, phew, you're losing them. Because they want to stop, reflect, apply their knowledge. 
And the lecture is just not the most appropriate method for promoting student thought. It has no critical collaborative component to it whatsoever. So if you want an initial test, that's fine. Let me go into another tack entirely, and I'm going to go into the psychology of a learning for a minute, because this is where the real battle is. If you really do believe in the scientific method and think we should have an evidence-based approach to teaching, then what does the psychology of learning say about lectures? Actually, in 2,000 years, I haven't found one single sentence that supports them. A lot of people have put their minds to this problem. Nobody's saying the lecture is the way to do this. It's a default, it's a fossil, it's a medieval relic. For a start, why have one hour? We only have one hour. Lectures in universities and colleges are largely one hour. That's for the benefit of the timetabling. It's only because the Babylonians had a base 60 number system that we have hours in the first place. It's got absolutely nothing to do with the psychology of learning. And as we know, if we watch YouTube or TED or people who really know what they're doing, the hour is a hopeless time. It's just like television, you know? People in the BBC produce programs that are half an hour and an hour because they have to be timetabled for the radio times, for God's sake. We have the web. It should be as long as it needs to be, guys. And that's about 10 or 15 minutes, or sometimes in YouTube, two minutes. It depends on the task. It's certainly not this default an hour. And how many times have you been to lectures or even talks at conferences where you know that the whole thing has been padded out to fit the time? It happens all the time. Usually, really shit teachers put the history of the topic at the beginning or the learning objectives. <laughs> the, the really bad teachers always put the objectives of the course up front and bore people shitless before they've even started. You know, imagine going to the cinema and getting a precy of the plot before you watch the movie. How <laughs> stupid. Blame Gagne for that. He put that in his nine steps of stupid instruction. And of course, we have Ted and other things. I'm, not, you know, I'm a sort of fan of Ted, uh, you know, I quite like, but at least they made some effort on production values. They keep it short, it's as long as it should be, good combination of visuals. Sometimes they just let the person speak, it depends. They play to it here. The second one is this tyranny of time. Why should I turn up anywhere at a specific time to learn anything? You know, I'm 54 years old, I ain't going back to university. I'm not gonna turn up for a, a specific place in a specific time just because some academic has scheduled the course. I want it in my time, and we do have media sharing. It does exist out there. Uh, we do have time shift. We do use BBC I and all those other things. So let's think about time shifting and not time tabling, which is what universities tend to do. And then we've got YouTube EDU, all that jazz. Lewin up there, look at the number of hits here. Just shy of half a million. Now, a normal physics lecture, even if they have 100 students in a class and do it two or three times a week, takes about 20 years to get anywhere near 100,000. The scalability of this is absolutely phenomenal. Now, let's just say that the argument is, well, video is a slightly impoverished medium. You don't get as much as the live impact and so on. It doesn't matter. You've got half a million guys who have seen your lecture. You know, do the sums here. It makes no sense not to record them and not to use the good stuff. Just like movies, just like books. I mean, we don't get every lecturer to write their own textbook. So why do we insist that everybody has to be a teacher even when they're not suited to teaching? iTunes U? MIT courseware? All the physics stuff here? Absolute fantastic. Interestingly, the top, do you know what the top course is in iTunes U? Sex in the ancient world. Warwick University, that's what, that's what students really look at, you know, when you give them free choice and what sort of lectures they want to walk at chat. Interestingly, however, uh, Lewin's physics lectures also appear in the top 10 of all those media on YouTube. You know, he, the, the, in other words, there's some serious people studying serious stuff using this. And when you look at the demographics of this, there are kids in the third world and in China and Africa really, really benefiting from this in a way that was unimaginable just a few years ago. The third one is this tyranny of location, you know, the fact that you have to be here, you know, you know, in this room, this like Greek amphitheater, you can't plug your laptop in, it's taken a lot of money to get here, you're staying in some hotel or whatever. There's something quite odd about this, having to be somewhere, unless it's a good event where you're doing lots of networking, and I know you will be having looked at the program, so come around here. Now, psychological attention, this is the big one, really, you know, and don't tell me you haven't been like this at a conference. I haven't, be, I haven't, I'm 50, uh, 54 in December. I have never been to a conference where on the second day I haven't been bored shitless, with almost pains in my chest with boredom. I, honestly, I give talks at conferences all the time. I'm always bored. 
I don't know how people get away with it. I don't know why people pay for it half the time. But there seems to be a sort of acceptance that you can bore and you can be bored. Cognitive overload. This is, cognitive overload is an interesting one. And new teachers, especially in schools, suffer from this really badly. In other words, you underestimate how difficult it is to learn and you really hammer the students with too much stuff too quickly. And that, by and large, is what the lecture encourages you to do. It encourages padding out. It encourages too much stuff too quickly. And cognitive overload is the absolute disease for learners. It's everywhere. Almost all teachers suffer from this, even good ones. It takes years and years and years to draw yourself back, to simplify, to cut it down, to pare back, and to teach effectively. And then, you know that video I showed you at the beginning? Imagine if I had stood up here and just read that from a piece of text, that script. It would have been crap. It would have had nearly the same effect. And hardly anybody in the education and training system has even looked at the structure of memory on a, on a, on a very schematic level. They'd be hard pressed to make a distinction between semantic and episodic memory. They might know about short-term working memory and long-term memory. They would know very little actually about the real techniques which affect or shunt stuff from working to, to long-term memory. But the big one here is episodic and semantic. And by and large, lectures are, are sort of episodic experiences. In other words, you know, you, they're giving you the sort of live video view of a live person, but they're shoving semantic information at you. And the, the mind doesn't cope with that very well. So you have this huge confusion over media mix. And when people do use PowerPoint, they have hardly any knowledge about the appropriate use of text, images, animation, video, and audio. Hardly anybody knows how to use these things properly, because it takes time to learn. And then learn by doing, even in physics. Good physicists learn loads in the lab, and they learn loads by applying their knowledge to real problems. And the lecture room just cuts that out. It's absolutely hopeless. And we've had, you know, plenty, 150 years of theory here from William James, Dewey, Kolb, Shank, lots of really good theory on this, showing that it's an absolutely necessary condition for learning even a subject like physics. And yet, we abandon it. Except in medicine, clinical practice, I think, that, you know, they've always been quite good in this and, and, and in the sciences to a degree. And in another big one, space practice, I've already mentioned Ebbinghaus. You know, it's 120 years ago the guy came up with a basic statement, which has remained eternally true, which is you don't learn a damn thing without repeated practice over time. You just don't. And therefore, this one-off lecture, this one-off episodic thing is still the norm. It doesn't make any sense. And I like this example because it, again, relates it back to, to, to science and this school teacher up in the side who actually decided to take space practice and apply it to these kids and got the same results after 90 minutes of teaching with his cohort of science teachers using space practice than he had with a class who had been doing it for several years. It really does work. Not collaborative, that's obvious. How many of you have had, you know when you come into English, uh, it's a very British thing, this, it's less so in the States. You come in at a conference hall and maybe there were half the number here. Everybody sits with a, with a sort of chair between them. You can see it here, you know, people spread out. In other words, they absolutely hate talking to anybody next to them. I've lived in England for 26 years and I still cannot get over the fact that people never speak to me in the train. In fact, when I speak to them, my accent, of course, they think I'm crazy, you know, but the, uh, it, it, you know, this is not the environment to encourage collaboration. It just isn't. It does the very opposite. It isolates people. Isolates people. And then I've mentioned this already, this whole notion of personality problems. You know, the people who are primarily recruited to be researchers regard teaching as an adjunct or a sideline. This is wrong. And until we reset the system so that we don't assume that every teacher has to be a researcher, which is how it used to be, I love the 92 reforms in the higher education sector, but it had a very destructive effect, I think, in producing lots of second and third rate research, but more importantly, getting lots of people who are inappropriate researchers to teach at the same time. We have to recognize that this is a truth and therefore cut back on the whole lecture thing. Now, what happens when people, academics, go into second life and decide to play around with this medium? Hey, presto, they build a bloody lecture theater. 
it's crap enough in the real world without mimicking it in, in the virtual world. And have you ever been along to any of these lectures? <laughs> I mean, they are absolute hoot. There's usually, there's usually the guy and his couple of his mates, and, uh, and then within five minutes, somebody pops in and offers you sex. That's, that's what happens in Second Life. You know? <laughs> it's absolutely hopeless. Why, did, why do people do this? Don't they recognize the stupidity in the model in the real world before tackling it in, in the other world? And let me end on a serious note here because this is really a fundamental piece of research that I go back to time and time again by Carol Twigg. Big bit of research, 8.8 .8 million, 30 community colleges in the UK using technology to affect learning, getting away from the old lecture model. Is it cost effective? Yes. Are we seeing better learning? Yes. Can dropout rates be reduced? Yes. But what was more interesting was the recommendations in the research with regard to how you should proceed, which is what most of you guys do for a living. And the important thing, I think, was number three, which is don't fiddle about with courses, just redesign them. Take the course, reconstruct it. Don't assume that the lecture is a necessary condition for success. It may be culturally, but it's unlikely to be pedagogically. And don't bolt on the new technologies. You know, that's, that's what you do by recording lectures. Why don't we look at the very nature of a lecture and rethink that one rather than just recording them? Cultural problems, of course. But I think I'd like to end on that note because you guys are in the middle of these wars, these battles with regard to implementing technology, and you will be hitting barriers left, right, and center. So I'll end on that note, and good luck to you all. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. OK, thank, thank, you, very, yeah, thank you very much, Don. If you could just hang around for some questions. We've, sure. we've due to kind of end at around 20 past we've got shuffle time um, so we all have to shuffle at shuffle time um, but until then we got some, a chance uh, we wanted to give good good amount of time for people to ask questions I see we've got hands up already we also may have one or two questions coming through on illuminate um, so they're, they're com coming potentially from different places but we'll focus on the hall at the moment first hand up there from someone in blue Hi, Donald. Hi. Lindsay Jordan from University of the Arts, London. I think you had a really tough job there, Donald, um, you know, knocking the lecture in a lecture. Um, so how else would you have, um, you know, how else would you have, to use your word, delivered that? Well, yeah, good question. The, mo most of my activity is not doing this. Most of the things I do in life in terms of effect, well, you know, having built a company and tried to affect change for your learning and currently has been, is online. And I blog a lot. I'm on Facebook a lot, I Twitter a lot, most of the activity. If you look at people who blog a lot and have been doing it for many years and build an audience, you get audiences that are 10 times bigger than any one audience you're gonna get at a keynote at a conference. So you go for scalability. And I would say, I have said absolutely nothing today that isn't on my blog. Absolutely nothing. And I would say that would be my, you know, my first port of call. And when I'm looking for interesting information, I've never been to an alt conference before. I'm not a member of alt, but I've looked at loads of alt talks and I've found some of them you know, pretty inspiring, but I do it online. I'm not gonna come up to Nottingham from Brighton necessarily when I know I can see it online. I just don't see the point in this. I just don't get it. You know, don't you watch TED? You're unlikely to pay three grand to go and see TED, but surely you watch it online. That's a much prefer. I'm not gonna spend three grand going there but I, I, I watch those videos endlessly. In other words, I think we should all be focusing our attention on a different mix, which is more online than offline. I think the conferences are a bit odd, to be honest. <laughs> okay, thank you. Looking for some more hands. I mean, I, I certainly have a question um, in the interim. I mean, it's, it's around that kind of you know, observation around people, the teachers' skills, um, teachers rather than lecturers' skills, and. Um, you know, no, nobody really knows, you know, how, what, how, how to use, you know, the right kind of pedagogical combination of text, you know, <coughs> images, so mm. forth, around the kind of issue of semantic memory. I mean, how are we going to get over that one? Well, first of all, I think you should give up on trying because, it, I mean, I, I ran a company for many, many years. I wouldn't dream of taking people in the IT department and turning them into salespeople. I wouldn't in a million years dream of doing that because their personalities would be well suited to it. They wouldn't want to do it. And in every academic institution in Britain, you have the same problem. You have people who want to do research and do not want to teach and do it reluctantly and badly. So the solution to the problem is not to force them round pegs into square holes, is to accept that there's another solution to this problem, which is not getting those people to teach and making a distinction between teaching and research. Until we do that, we are forcing 
round pegs into square holes, and there will be crap teaching. It's a consequence of that. And so, I, you know, I, I don't think it's a training problem. Okay, um, a few more. Nigel, I think, was first, and then one down here. My interest, Donald, is to follow on from Vanessa's question. What you cover in terms of the presentation to us today and other presentations I've seen you deliver is what happens between the person who's contracted to be a lecturer and a group of people who've signed up to be their students. You don't seem to cover the policy and strategy issues and the implications for what you're saying for, for the institutions. I'll leave it at that. Well, yeah, that's right. And then I, I don't come along and talk about that, but I, I have been heavily involved in that. And I've worked with people, like Alan Langlands is the chief exec of Hefke, and I've known Alan for years. He was at Scots County. He was the vice chancellor of Dundee University. I worked him on major projects trying to get uh, medical schools worldwide to come together to share basic undergraduate content, which hardly any of them do stupidly. So medical schools typically even have graphics departments. They're still drawing the human body. <laughs> stupidly, 100 grand a pop these departments cost. I've worked with that, I've worked with David Willits recently on, on real policy. I mean, I think we're facing some really big problems. I don't remember the Labour Party, by the way, but they're absolutely hopeless on this. The, the interesting thing that will face us in the very near future, and I mean October, is the absolute need to teach more students with less money and less resources. And until we grasp some of these problems, we won't get anywhere. Now, I think I'm a great admirer of the Open University and Martin Bean. We've had it since 1969, and we haven't actually managed to exploit it in the way we should, not only within that institution, but in other institutions. But people like David Willits will do this. You will be able to study at a distance to a degree you never did before. I think there are some enlightened people around who will push the system in that direction. In other words, there are real policy things, but you've got to get, you've got to get involved in politics at the higher level to do that, which I, I've been involved in politics all my life. And uh, that's a different scale of things. And it's quite difficult to come and launch out at conferences on that, uh, to be honest, and, and say what's in pipelines and planning. Thanks. One, one down at the front here. You said, Donald, that forcing researchers to teach is forcing like a square peg into a round hole. Not all of them, but many. Yeah, well, you know. But likewise, if you're a fantastic teacher, you can inspire learning in a whole range of individuals. You're never going to get a job in a university unless you've got a research track record. Yeah. So isn't it time we change the, the, you know, what are we trying to do in universities? Is it research or is it teaching? But are they two very different things? That's the other question. Well, they are, and of course, what you said there was true of the UK system, but it's not true in the US. There, you know, there are teaching universities. And uh, I, I, did, I, went to, I went to an Ivy League university, and uh, it was an absolute revelation for me at 20 to go to a place where at the end of the, at the, end of the first semester, I got a form asking my opinion as a student of the teacher. I have never, ever experienced that in a British university. I'm sure, I understand that it's changed somewhat now. But I think you've hit the nail on the head here. If we continue with this catch-22, we have a massively inefficient system. There is no human endeavor more efficient, inefficient, I think, than education and training. It's absolutely hopelessly mired in old theory and practice, and these political catch-22s. You're absolutely right in what you say, but the point is politically to change that, and there are people who believe it must be changed. I think this is going to happen quite quickly myself, having some knowledge of the political environment this distinction between teaching institutions and teaching and research institutions. There's huge pressure on the system to change them. Okay, one in the middle, just towards the back, yeah. Keep your hand up. Then we can find you. Thanks. Um, Diane Brewster, uh, ex-University of Sussex, and uh, currently Open University. Um, I agree with, with a lot of what you said, but I think one of the problems um, that I've experienced is, is an estates problem, a, a physical building problem. We're still building lecture theatres and seminar rooms. You know, I know a lot of, of tutors who want to move away from the lecture paradigm. They might occasionally want to give a lecture uh, as, a, as a kind of inspirational thing to do to get students engaged, but they want to do more kind of workshop-based 
activities. And we still have seminar rooms with notices saying, do not rearrange the furniture in this room. We've got lecture theatres with bolted down seats that you can't do group work in, in a space like this. You can talk to the person next to you, you know, risk a, a crook neck and turn around to the person behind you. But th there is a whole issue, I think, about estates and about the model of teaching and learning in universities, which needs to go beyond us uh, and, and beyond the lecturers to, to management and, and estates. Brilliant question. Great dark secret of the higher education system. I came in a taxi to this uh, building and I counted five builder vans, five, never saw a single student and four gardeners. And what seems to be the campus of a small country, size of a small country. There is a huge problem here. Speak to Alan Langlands on this. In the last round of cuts in universities, most of the cuts came on capital expenditure because he knows and has believed for years that people spend far too much money on building monumental buildings. And there are far too many vice and pro-chancellors chasing CBEs in monument building. And it's an absolute disgrace uh, building more rooms like this and forgetting how learning is really tackled. But of course, we saw that last round of cuts, a massive cut, not in teaching and research. Most of the cut was actually in capital expenditure. And that's absolutely right. You know, I get the sense that, no, I was coming in the taxi, I get the sense that nothing, the great danger with Northern Towns will become a university and students will have people teaching people and nobody else doing anything else. These institutions are getting enormous in terms of the capital estate, and they are incredibly badly managed. If you look at the data on occupancy in university buildings, it's unbelievable and criminally low, way below 50%. Any other area of human endeavor, you'd be sacked on the spot for not using buildings properly, but most of them are empty most of the time. I went to the University of Ulster recently and to give a talk, and I went into a building which was four stories high in Derry, fully lit on every floor, and there wasn't a single person in the building. It was completely and utterly empty. It took me ages to find a human being on the campus to get to this lecture theater. And that's criminal and stupid. And uh, I blame the management of universities. I, again, this is a very unpopular thing. People say that managerialism has crept into university. My arse it has. These are mostly academics and ex-academics badly managing estates. They don't know how to manage buildings. They're falling down. They don't know how to put money aside for maintenance. It's a mess. Sorry, I get, I get really angry in that. You know, I've got kids. I don't, I don't want this happening, you know. I don't want to spend money on more buildings like this. It make any sense. We've, uh, we've actually got one come through on Twitter that's uh, right. a, an interesting, which is, uh, could Donald uh, summarise what he recommends as alternatives to the lecture? Well, we, have, we already have institutions that have been... I remember, that it was 50 years ago now that the Open University was set up. You know, 200,000 students, the biggest university in the UK. Nobody's on the campus. It's, you know, 10, 20 times the size of another any other university in the UK. We've had this model for 50 years. And if you go across to the States and the University of Phoenix, there are lots of examples where we've managed to dispense with the lecture as the basic pedagogic technique. People still get their degrees. And if you look at the data from students in the OU, they absolutely love it. They score immensely well on student satisfaction. It's not as if I have to come up with any models here. They're staring everyone in the face. The problem is that the institutions are hermetically sealed with their own budget and funding mechanisms that make them fight each other rather than share. You know? The, the playing fields, the sports fields here were unbelievable. Not one single sportsman on them, but I bet there are poor kids on the outskirts in Nottingham who are really struggling to find a football field. That's criminal and stupid. We should be sharing those common facilities rather than hermetically sealing them up in institutions and letting academics manage them. It's not what they like doing. They don't like doing it, and they can't do it well. Any? Yep, we've got more. We've got two. We've got one sort of at the back in the middle and then one just on this edge. I'm getting gradually angrier and angrier. Uh, you know, I've got to calm down. <laughs> I have a heart attack. I think we can probably <laughs> take these two and then one right at the back, and then we'll leave Hi. There. Um, I think it's a bit... Um, a bit dangerous, isn't it, to polarise things as either teaching or research? Because there's lots of people that are sitting in the middle that, you know, the research informs the teaching and vice versa. So there are quite a few people who are quite good teachers who are also researchers. I would so agree I with think that. it's a bit, you know, it's a bit in the current climate, a bit dangerous to say it's either going to be research or teaching. I don't think there's any climate where you don't say what you think. 
is a university. It was supposed to be open to critical thinking and new ideas, surely. But I, I think if you look at the, the distribution curve on this, it is, it's a good question. I would agree with that. I think in some subjects, actually, specifically in the arts and so on, actually practitioners and researchers actually probably do make good teachers. But in physics, where it's a non-volatile subject, difficult to learn, difficult to teach, there's no reason whatsoever that researchers should be teaching because they're bad at it. And I was, you know, we have to look at the subject by subject, look at the distribution curve, and take a reasonable view in it. I mean, I'm not going to be completely one way or the other on this. I think there are some researchers who will be good teachers, some teachers who will be good researchers, but the two are completely different skill sets. And there's no other area of human endeavor where we collude the two, coalesce them, and get such a messy outcome. But I would agree with you. I think there are lots of good researchers who are good teachers. Fine, let them teach. But we have to have some way of determining their competence. I mean, it's almost impossible to get sacked from a university for bad teaching. It is li literally impossible. <laughs> that will change in October because the pressures will be enormous. And my local university, Sussex, has just gone through a process of hiring lots of people. And it's called cuts. And it is a cut. And they've got rid of about 100 people, all on voluntary redundancy basis. But that's what you have to do. You have to weed and you have to feed if you're going to have a vibrant teaching community and a vibrant research community. You just can't have people hanging on forever. OK, we had one just out on this edge here. Yes, thank you. Uh, Niall Watts, University College Dublin. Um, I've been both a, a student in a campus-based university and uh, with the Open University, and I've also taught online and uh, studied online. Um, but I do think one thing that's a little bit missing from, and it's also a feature of the conference here today, is this kind of the social element. Social, you know you have social networking and uh, discussion forum and so on online. So there is the chance to interact with your peers yeah. and with the lecturers, which you do get around the lecture, maybe not in the lecture itself, but also at a conference. That's still a little bit missing in, in the online world. I would agree with that. I mean, uh, and of course, that's not an attack. You can get rid of lectures and still have that. It's nothing to do with whether lectures are a pedagogically good or bad thing. And indeed, my recommendation is that if you have a much more learner-centric view of the world and that blended learning, and I mean blended learning and not blended teaching, where they just dice up different teaching techniques, when you bring this in, you really do have a massive increase in the level of social learning, whether it be face-to-face -face or online. But the days, the current university system is really based on the 18-year-old undergraduate intake model, despite the fact the majority of students are a lot older than that. And it still is the rather old-fashioned and quaint idea that you can have a drunken meander for three or four years and still get a degree and not go to lectures. Those days are gone. It was a privilege for a chosen few. It's no longer something that we can afford. And I don't think it's something that's desirable either. I don't, you know, I, 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 I don't sort of buy that over-romanticized view of, uh, getting a whole load of rich kids together and allowing them three years to, to go through that experience. I, I don't really buy that much. But you're, you're right. I'm all in favor of the social stuff. I just think there's not one iota of social learning in a lecture room. And then final question at the back. Hi, Donald. It's Sal Cook from Just Tech This. Um, I just wanted to bring in the notion that you're talking about online. And I, too, have had lots of conversations with Alan as well. Um, what we're doing about the 10 million who are not online at the moment, who may well be charging towards this idea of HE, in inverted commas, have you got any thoughts about that you'd like to share with us around that whole notion of the FE paradigm, the schools things, the notion of how we're going to blend some of the fantastic ac activities that go on in those sectors and picking the best uh, out of some of those other areas and blending it with what goes on in the innovative parts of universities and trying yeah. looking at some of those things. I just wonder if you've got anything you'd like to share on that. So I, I, I'm, I'm going to be a contrarian ag against here on this one because you know I don't buy this glass half full thing. It's a tiny number of people who are not online. And if you want to be online in institutions, it's easy because every school has broadband, every institution has it. In fact, my experience as a school governor was salutary here. The inclusion agenda was actually counterproductive. Every time we came up and I found money for this school, kit for this school, rejected every time on the basis that a couple of kids didn't have broadband at school. In other words, the inclusion agenda ended up being exclusive. They wouldn't do a damn thing until everybody had something. Now, I don't remember this argument being applied to books. I mean, I, went to, I didn't have any books in my house when I went to school, but I can't remember teachers saying, well, we can't teach using books, guys, because Donald doesn't have any books at home. <laughs> a stupid argument. In other words, the inclusion people have suddenly become a sort of the fascists of the world where you can't actually do anything until everybody's got it. It makes no sense. No medium works like this, you know? And if that's the solution, we have Martha Lane Fox 
<laughs> Marceline Fox and inclusion. Everybody should have a pony or something. I don't know. Where did that one come from? <laughs> you know, what world are we living in when she gets chosen as a czar for inclusion? She haven't been in a sink of state in the last five minutes. But I, I think the, the point here is that in my experience in a school where I sat for four years desperately trying to get things done was that the debate was counterproductive, you know? The inclusion debate was the enemy of progress. It was very curious. But you go with the flow in this, and there are easy ways of dealing with those small number of kids who don't have access. It was a really easy thing in terms of homework and printouts and so on to cope with that problem in the end. The truth is that schools don't actually want to communicate with parents and therefore they don't want to open, it, they don't want to open these systems up. And that's, that was the real political battle was with the teachers. Interestingly, I don't believe in this digital divide thing at all. I think it's always been a series of fractures. It's not been a rich and poor issue necessarily. And in the schools I've been in, very often the teachers have been technophobic and rather snobbish and they have little televisions. They don't like buying big screen TVs and all that jazz, you know. It's that world that you're fighting against, the teachers and not the kids and their parents. They've all got Sky Plus and broadband. So, I, you know, I think I, I'm not too sure that I buy the, uh, the amount of effort that's been put on this. I certainly don't believe in the current method. And the levy, of course, is gone, so nobody will pay for it. Okay, well, thank you very much, Donald. Um, a great way to start the conference, I think, and uh, it's all food for thought for us. Let's give it a